Greetings Southwest Carpenters. Today I'm going to answer some of the frequently asked questions and I thank you to those of you who responded. We had over 200 questions and today I'm going to answer the seven most frequently asked questions. Later next week and the following week we're also going to have our president Pete Rodriguez and our vice president Frank Hawk answer questions. So if you submitted a question and I don't answer it today, just wait, you will get those answers from either the president or the vice president. Before I go into the question and answer, I really wanted to take a minute to thank all of you that are out there working, that are keeping our communities, our economy, and our union going forward. I thank you for your courage, and I'm really, really thankful for the steps that our contractors have taken and the way that you have taken to the new safety measures on the job site to not only know that you're safe when you're working on the job site, but for me, I've been on the job sites and I think we're safer on a job site than we are at a grocery store or a gas station or any other place in public. So thank you for what you're doing. So the number one question that we had was, from members who are on the fence, trying to decide whether or not they should go to work. For me, I think that our contractors have gone above and beyond what the CDC has recommended for safety measures on the job site. We see the social distancing. Now even this week we've seen uh, the implementation of wearing masks. We've seen staggered shifts where we make sure that not too many people are converging on the job sites at one time. Not too many carpenters trying to get in a man lift at any one time. And I also salute our contractors for taking our recommendation to cancel lunch trucks and catering services because that was creating a problem on the job site. But with all that said, and the message that I've had consistently is, we want to create choice. We want to create choice for our members whether they want to or don't want to work. No one is going to discriminate against you if you feel that it's better to stay at home and stay with your family. But for our members, and there's tens of thousands of our members that want an opportunity to work, we want to make sure that opportunity is there so they can work and also that the safety precautions are in place so when they go home, they know that, uh, that they're not going to take anything home with them. They're safe and their families are safe. The second most asked question was about our union halls and are they open? And yes, our union halls are opened. They're fully staffed, but there's one major change. We're asking everybody that can do business over the phone to do that business over the phone. You can get the numbers to your local union off of our website. And for those of you that still have a paper union card, you can get those numbers off the back of that card. We've also installed easy ups uh, out in front of the union halls. And at those easy ups, we have someone staffed there. They have all the information, uh, any paperwork that you might need, all of that's available. So this is uh, going to stay in effect through the month of April, we're hoping in May that we can open up the halls for normal business and also reinstitute re monthly union meetings. But we're going to play that by ear and wait until we get the all clear. It's safe to go back to normal before we do that. The next question we had was about schooling and our training centers and if members are required to attend training. What we've instituted is a normal schedule of classes. But if any apprentice or journeyman does not feel comfortable going to class, they can be excused. All that they have to do is call the training center, let them know that they won't be attending, and that training center will reschedule them. So once again, it's choice. We think it's important that we keep these training centers open for various reasons. One of them is that we've shifted a lot of the training to safety type training. We have ramped up the ICRA training. So when we get the call, 
and our members are asked to go out and set up containments, they know the proper way to do that. We also want to make sure that members that are out of work have the opportunity to go in and get their schooling out of the way so when this passes and work ramps up, they don't have to worry about missing work to go to school. And also, we don't want to inhibit the ability for our apprentices to get their upgrades. You know that you have to have work hours plus your schooling to get the upgrades. So we want to make sure that anyone that wants to go in, do their schooling, and get their raises aren't prohibited from doing that. We've also had many questions about the shutdowns on the East Coast. What is happening on the East Coast and what's happening here on the West Coast are two different stories. We caught it earlier on the West Coast. The measures that were put into place earlier has slowed the spread on the West Coast. And I really think that once again, our contractors and our members are doing a great job making sure job sites are safe. We are analyzing this hour to hour, day by day, and week by week. But as of today, we are a third of the way through April. I think if we can get another week or two through April and we continue to be safe, follow the measures on the job site, I don't foresee any job sites being shut down and I think we can keep moving forward. And once again, our members will have that opportunity of choice, whether to work or whether to stay home. The next question that was asked by many of the members was about our pension and the requirement to get 1,800 hours to get a full credit. Our pension hours and the value of the credits are based on one day in time. Every year we value that uh, pension and what it's worth on December 31st. So right now, although things are volatile, we have about eight months before we have to make any decisions on how this year, this pandemic, and how the stock market investments have gone up and down. We've got about eight months until we have to make that decision. Your trustees have already made other tough decisions about the health and welfare and making sure that our members are covered even though they may lack hours, we wanted to make sure that our members were covered and didn't have any out-of-pocket expenses is if they were infected with the virus and needed medical care or hospitalization. So the best I can say is stay tuned. In January, we'll have a better snapshot of what it is we need to do and we'll take the appropriate action then. Another question were those of you that have annuities as part of your contract, whether or not you can uh, pull money out of those annuities. The federal uh, COVID relief law that went into effect on April 1st drastically changed uh, the avenue for pulling money out of your annuity. They waived the penalties, they uh, beefed up some of the regulations about loans that you can take, so the answer is yes, you can pull money out of your annuity right now. I would say that your best bet is to call the number that's provided and talk to those that administer your annuity. They are the ones that are the experts in this field and they can tell you what you can and can't do and what type of ramifications, payment of loans, taxable, uh, taxable income, they'll be able to answer those questions better than I, so I'm going to defer to them. The last question, and I've seen this personally on Facebook, is about hazard pay. And my opinion is we've had hazard pay factored into our agreements for years and years. The general public that drives by a construction project and sees a carpenter 100 feet in the air hanging off a form that's hazardous and the general public wouldn't do that. A drywaller that's hanging board in shafts, that's hazardous and the general public would never even think about doing that. Our millwrights that are rigging thousands and thousands of pounds of equipment and flying that into place, the general public saw that, they would say that's hazardous and dangerous. And all the other aspects of our work, people just don't don't think that it's something that they want to do. 
but working with our partners and with OSHA and our training funds, we've created ways where we could perform those at the safest level that's possible. So right now I see this pandemic as just another day at the office for our members. Our contractors, the owners, and our union have put in safety measures that make it as safe to be on a job site as it would to be in a grocery store or for a lot of people even to be at home. So hazard pay, I think we already have it. And the other thing that we have to be uh, cognizant of is that people are gonna judge us how we react in this situation. Are we going to try to leverage the situation? Are we gonna take advantage of the situation? Just remember these owners and these contractors are the ones that we're gonna to have to negotiate contracts with in the near future. And they are either gonna have the perception that Carpenters Union did everything they could to keep us viable, to keep us productive, to keep us profitable during that pandemic? Or is it gonna be the Carpenters Union that tucked its tail and ran and took advantage of them? So hey members, those are the seven questions that I was asked to answer. Once again, thank you for everything that you're doing. Thank you for staying essential. And for me, my hashtag is carpenters have always been essential. So carpenters, stay essential, stay safe, stay healthy. See you again real soon. Thank you.